Parkinson's disease is a neurological movement disorder affecting an estimated 1 million Americans, including many under age 40. The American Parkinson Disease Association is the largest grassroots network in the United States, working to help ease the burden and find the cure for those coping with Parkinson's. Visit APDAoptimism.org today to find out how you can help millions live with dignity and optimism. Your action today will help APDA put an end to Parkinson's disease. As a VA doctor, I get more time to focus on my patients. And as you can imagine, the rewards are considerable. So are the benefits. Plus, I only need one active state license to practice in any VA facility. You know, it's bigger than giving back to my country. It's giving our veterans the care they deserve. Learn more about careers with today's VA at vacareers.va.gov. I'm Patricia Mickelson. I'm public access, and so are you. I'm Ms. NLA, Ms. Ms. National Leather Association International 94. It's kind of like being the Miss Universe of Leather. There's a sister title. Um, her, their title is uh, IMSL, International Ms. Leather, and we go around internationally representing the SM Leather fetish community. We're a, a pansexual group of people, so we uh, represent men, women, lesbian, gay, straight, bi, transgenders. Any sort of kink and fetish, as long as it's safe, sane, and consensual, that's the big thing. Do your thing, but do it safely. Anyway, um, now that I did that, I'm going to take off um, any other pertinent announcements. Oh, yes, I'm wearing a different collar this year. I belong to a new person. <laughs> and I think this, this is going to work this time. So for those of you who know me personally, um, things are really increased in my life in that respect. She got a lie to the place. You know, was, was the woman who got me through the during leather competitions that I was involved in. Um, but we'll get on to talking a little bit about that. So what is SM Leather? you want to start? SM Leather is technically sadomasochistic expression of your sexuality, and we know it the quickest way to recognize it is leather, so it's a lie together. Originally, when it started being known to the general public, it was through the biker groups. The bikers trademark it in their bike with their leather. That's continued. No matter how much everything else is changing in the leather SM fetish community, leather and SM are apparently permanently linked. It's not absolutely necessary to be into leather to be into SM. It's not absolutely necessary to be into sadomasochism to be in the weather. There are those of us who walk into a leather shop deep, breathe deep and just enjoy the experience. <laughs> then there's others who have no affinity for leather at all, find it hot, uncomfortable, don't like the smell of it, but they really enjoy the toys. Then there's those of us that tend to enjoy both parts. <laughs> and as you begin to explore those areas, you find out your fetishes. Everybody seems to have a fetish, or two, or more. Um, in my case, it found me a very wonderful woman. I walked into an NLA meeting thinking, well, I want to explore the leather community again. I have, I just briefly dabbled in college. I walked in and went, whoa, long silky hair. We found my fetish before we thought about leather. Um, <laughs> other people, their fetish is boots. That's kind of hard to avoid the leather. Um, they enjoy the look, the feel, the symbolism. Um, you want to go on from there? Yeah, fetishes can be many things. Um, by definition, a fetish is anything that enhances a sexual experience. Um, I really enjoy uniforms. I not only like wearing them, but I think 
they look hot on people. Specifically, women in uniforms make me drool. Good looking men in uniforms do too. Um, <laughs> and that's by, you know, my, by a personal definition. Um, latex, uh, Victorian dress, drag and cross dressing, hair, shaving. Some people are into belt bondage, some people are into ropes and chain bondage. Anything that just really knocks your socks off, whatever it is that makes you tick, uh, is what fetish is. The leather scene or leather SM scene, the biggest thing to remember, this is where it's at. It's in your head. You can have the most hot scenes in the world and not touch each other because it's all what goes on here. And another thing that I really want to stress is leather SM play is not the same thing as having sex because you can have a very hot scene that includes, let's say, some piercing, some candle wax, some whipping, um, ice play, role play, and never do anything that is overtly genitally sexual and still have a really powerful exchange of energy. And that's a real keystone for SM leather fetish. It's a consensual exchange of power, an exchange of energy. It's what allows a lot of heterosexual men to play in an SM arena with men, no matter how uncomfortable they would be in the sexual content. It's what allows a lesbian to play with a man and still enjoy it, because it literally is just an exchange of power, working with another person's personalities and exploring their reactions and your reactions. It doesn't have to mean arousal. A lot of times it does, but that also doesn't mean if it if it involves a sexual arousal, you don't have to follow through on it to enjoy the experience. But it can be very, very safe. Another way to find it is that favorite Conti sauce you have. You dip a chip in, you take the first bite, it you know, kind of gives you that good afterburn. When you go for the second chip, that's SM. <laughs> she watches me get masochistic with her sobbing. I sit there grabbing my face in pain, and the tears are going down my face, and then I reach for another support level. But once, you know, now that we've kind of talked around some of the light, the, the definitions of what SM leather fetish is, and mostly it's what you make it, um, there are four major concepts that as a responsible leather person, because just in any in any other community, there are folks who aren't so responsible. You play safe, sane, consensual, and compassionate. Safe, we'll take first. It's the easiest to explain, although it's not always agreed on. Safe means you are physically safe. You are not going to be permanently injured. You, pay, you can play with things that are dangerous. Yes, you can play with knives, you can play with bull whips. All of these can be deadly, but you learn how to handle them properly, which means safely. Where you get the stimulation from working with them, you get the skills, you do not harm people. Uh, safety means if you're involving genital sex with your SM, you pay attention to condoms, you pay attention to whether you are dealing with blood sports. You learn about STDs, you learn about AIDS, so that you still have a toy to play with the next day. The worst thing in the world is to get a hold of someone who has not been treated safely, and you start to play and find out you can't. Well, I say the worst thing. The worst thing is to find out that you've harmed somebody. And you can do it as the person delivering the pain, you can do it to yourself by not stopping them. You are always allowed to stop what is going on, no matter who you are, no matter what your reason is. There is a concept known as the safe word. You negotiate ahead of time what you're going to do. You let each other know any physical or mental risks that are involved. And you decide on a safe word that is not going to be uttered normally in the transaction of whatever you're doing. We have a friend whose favorite one is pickle. <laughs> when he's playing, he's not going to be talking about dill pickles. If his bottom calls pickle, he knows something's wrong, and it means stop. Uh, the most common one is for people to use stoplight signals. Green, nobody uses because that means go. Yellow means 
okay, we're in an area where you've got to be a little more cautious. I'm having a few problems, but I don't want to stop. I may want to change what's happening, how it's happening, the intensity, the frequency, but I want to continue. Red, stop. Our people, we have rights, we have brains, we are intelligent, powerful human beings. We're not mindless, faceless entities who have no rights and no privileges. It is to remind each of us that we have a basic humanness and we right to our feelings and right to be cared for and to be careful of others. And all, the old guard or the old style leather folk were not as inclined to remember that because things were very hard and fast. The master had the final say, the mistress had the final slay, and the slaves in the bottoms had no say at all. Once you consented to do a scene, that was it. That's not how it is anymore. If y'all have read the story of O or something like that, seen the movie, that is not what we're about. That's not what we're talking about as far as the um, total surrender of consent and will and the total abnegation of the person to another. That's an amusing fantasy for some people. And yeah, it can be real hot jerk off literature, but that's not how the day to day living of, uh, in the SM world is necessarily. The other thing about compassion is to realize, yes, you've laid all this out, what you're going to do. If it goes wrong, you don't get angry. You say, well, it didn't work. Yeah. We, stop. we may start over. Uh, cases where I would be doing something to someone and they didn't call their safe words, I've done it to her, where all of a sudden I wasn't real sure what kind of shape she was in, and I would stop and check. Uh, in the old school train of thought, you didn't stop and check. You went go until they call that same word. And if they called it, everything's over. Goodbye. What we are trying to teach people to do is you check along the way. You remember you are dealing with a human with feelings and fears and likes and dislikes. And you ask, you watch, you pay attention. And then if they get into trouble, you don't blame them for not being able to follow through on what they thought they could. I know that I'm not going to get any creepy crawlies from it. She's not going to get any creepy crawlies from it. Or somebody else I play with isn't. And more importantly, my reputation is still going to be good. I'm not going to be known as, you know, the typhoid Mary of the leather scene. Because <laughs> your reputation precedes you and follows you. If you're a safe player, people know about it. If you're not a safe player, people know about it. Um, but on to roles of role playing and things like that? Yes, no, maybe? Mm -hmm. Oh, that gets more and more confusing to me as time goes on. Because... <laughs> <laughs> They're in the middle, folks! Um, exactly. Hi, Eric. Um, <laughs> the, basic, uh, the basic roles you can have are top, bottom, or switch. Dominant, submissive, or swings both ways, depending upon the moment. In my primary relationship, I'm a slave. And that's a very um, heavy uh, role of submission. When I don't, when I'm not playing in my primary relationship, I'm primarily a top. There are a few people I will bottom for, but not many. And that has to do with my emotional. personalities, uh, or personas, that's a better word, excuse me. There's Artemis who's here, the uh, politically correct leather dyke who runs around doing workshops and everything else. <laughs> then I also have an aspect of me who's definitely a, a very rotten monster brat of a boy. There's also a very gentle, very fragile little girl. She doesn't get dressed in pink. No. <laughs> but then again, my, my daddy wouldn't dress me in pink anyway. <laughs> and when she says daddy, SM is great because you're dealing with a lot of people that have all these different interests, so they, they don't have any justification for saying, well, I'm okay, you're weird. <laughs> so for me, it, it was 
a great place for me to <laughs> let loose with a few things. Uh, when they ask her whether I butcher film, she turns to me and says, my daddy's a drag queen. <laughs> <laughs> because, okay, yes, physically, anatomically, I am female. Most of the time, I'm female inside. But every once in a while, there is this person that comes out called Max. <laughs> and Max is a very convincing male, even to males. SM, because it's safe, sane, consensual, and compassionate, has nothing to do with abuse and violence. Those are diametrically opposed. I've been in abusive relationships with people who are in the leather scene, with people who are not in the leather scene. There, it's like night and day. Abuse is not sane. Abuse is not consensual. I have no control what's going on. It doesn't feel good. I don't like it. I don't deserve it. And those are some of the major features. What is the difference between SM and abuse? So in a nutshell, I'd like to leave it at that. One of the things about leather folk is that we claim all of our sexuality. We are overtly out front, in your face, this is what we like. And this is what we enjoy. And I think that's what makes leather people, leather women, a very major rebel and a threat to the society that we live in because we're not ashamed of who we are, what we are, and what we like. And how often can you go up to a partner, whoever that might be, and say, I want this, 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 and this, and let's do it. Usually, vanilla sex, non-leather sex, you're guessing, you have no idea, you're not real communicative, or um, stretching your limits is not something that's indulged in. And I think perhaps that's what makes it scary, or that's what makes it, the judgment comes in, because we're, we're on the edge. We're going for over the brink, and we make no bones about it. Basically, one thing to think about, if you dress out on the left, if you, or right, uh, <laughs> uh, this, is, this, is, this is my right left. Um, <laughs> if you are wearing keys, floggers, handcuffs, armbands, if you're predominantly dressed out on the right, that means you are a submissive or a bottom. Wear a collar. You're probably a submissive, not necessarily. Or you can do that a fashion statement and about get yourself in trouble. And usually, <laughs> usually, if you have a collar with a lock on it, it's pretty darn good um, that you're owned property. You belong to someone. You're in some sort of a committed relationship. Not necessarily a lover, but you have a master or a mistress who owns you. If you're dressed out left, all your stuff on the left, you're a top or, or um, a dominant. If you wear your keys in the middle or your cuffs in the middle or your hanky in the middle, that means you switch. I confuse the bejesus out of people. I'm an owned top. I'm a slave with an attitude. That's what's fun. As far as hanky coats go, there, there's a myriad of different colors, and if you wear it in the right hand side, that means you're the receiver or the submissive. If you wear it in the left hand side, you're the active or giver. Like, if you're into heavy, heavy SM, you wear black in the either right or left pocket. If you're into, um, let's see, light SM, Robin's egg blue. As it's in my presence. That's when you find that. Yeah, I, I would be really laid back walking through a group of people and someone approach her with disrespect as a person. I've been known to go after them verbally, not physically, but verbally, and get in their face and explain to them what life is about. And I don't like having to do that. Why did you do that? Um, Usually, lately, it's because she's a title holder and she has to keep a nice public face and not piss people off. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm turning 40 this year. I work for a, a very assaulted organization. We've been firebombed. I don't <coughs> care 
if I piss off an individual who I think is wrong, if they are being disrespectful to another human being, I would get in their face and tell them so. Because all they're going to be able to do is come back at me on it. I would rather I have to do it than her when she's got other concerns. And also from a more technical point of view in the leather seat, um, <laughs> a, a submissive or a bottom, if you're having problems with somebody, it's like, Daddy, that man over there said bad things to me. Can you go please take care of it? Or that woman was really rude to me. Can you go adjust her attitude? <laughs> that's one of the perks you give up all you may be giving up she may give up all her power to me, but that's one of her perks is okay, I gave you my power, please go use it. So I don't have to deal with it. Okay. I'm Patricia Mickelson, I'm Public Access, and so are you. Gather around and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started from this tropic port aboard this tiny ship. The mate was a mighty sailing man, the skipper brave and sure. Five passengers set sail that day for a three-hour tour. Boom! The weather started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed, if not for the courage of the fearless crew the minnow would be lost. The minnow would be lost. The ship's aground on the shore of this uncharted desert isle, with Gilligan, the skipper too, the one percenter, and his wife, the movie star, the man of science, Marianne, here on Gilligan's Island. So here's the story of our castaways. They're here for a long, long time. They'll have to what? They're still there? Oh, this is stupid. Flint, you told me if I came in this week I could do Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. That's it. I'm out of here. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm leaving. And I'm taking my chair with me. try and change again you know I just might lose my game maybe it's hard to see and I can't win or lose but if I dream a little while longer you know some of it might come true but don't 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 let it bother me no 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 I don't I'm easy, I ain't got no worries, and my losing can often be lonely, but don't, don't, don't let it bother me, no, 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 I don't. I'm choosy, I'm choosy, I'm choosy. I ain't got no choice, no choice, no choice. My expectations are straight from the source of course, of course. My welfare depends on my dependence on you.
you. Well, we're just going to have to have a mutual admiration society here because I'm going to read my first poem dedicated to Lisa and Brenda. Um, and it's the one after which our act today, Ozark Rainstorm, is named. It's called The Rain Cloud and the Lightning Flash. Lisa, you are lightning. Brenda, you are cloud. Between you, I am dazzled and drenched in poetry. When your language storms the night, when your poems flash and flood, if you hear a thunder, clap and clap. That's me. This is a love poem called The Nut Sonnet. I'm a little nut cracked open by your love. I was dry and sealed inside my shell. Now I'm swimming in the pudding, somersaulting into caramel. I'm a little nut cracked open by my love. I was shriveling up inside myself. Now I'm swelling in the soup, dwelling in dark passion with the cherries. I'm a little nut cracked up by love. I was sleeping here all by myself. Now I'm carousing on the bed of rice. It's nice. Now that I've been sliced and ground and slivered up by love, I'm not a little nut. I'm nuts. <laughs> the queen unknown to herself. Now for this one, I'd like a little bit of audience participation when I get to the last two lines, which you'll be know because I will begin my friend. And then I want you all, and I want to hear your voices, I want you all to turn to your friend, to a friend, or to yourself, your friend, and, and say aloud the last two lines, and I will repeat them, and you will please, please say them with me. They're very easy. Um, so we'll say them together. A queen unknown to herself. My friend is a woman not dear to herself. She begs permission from the ground to walk on it. What can I do if she does not recognize the jewel in her breast? She apologizes to the river for stepping in its waters. Fear gnaws holes at the bottom of her boxes of grain and sugar. And she is not aware of what is draining her resources. What can I do if she will not raise her queenly scepter to banish fear? When will she hold up the fullness of her breasts? When will she realize her powers? They lie hidden within her like eggs. They trickle from her and she is ashamed. What can I do if she uses her queenly turban for a rag? People can smell that she is not dear to herself. Some of them hurt her and some of them help her. She bolts up at night, eyes wide with the hurt. She frets in the day with worry for the help. What can I do if she does not know herself a queen? When will she spring like a panther and leap like a deer? When will she learn that she can walk on water and become froth and enter the sea? When will she leave behind land and stooped huts? My friend, my friend, my friend, when will you don your majesty and become the queen that you are? Song at first, it'll sound really familiar to you, probably. Maybe. 
Depends on your age, I guess. <laughs> we think that it'll sound familiar to many of you. Um, but really, it was one of those songs that when you really started listening to the words, you were kind of like, really not very real. So we took this song and we changed it, turned the words around a little bit and changed it to make it just slightly more powerful to our team. <laughs> Uh, speaking of poultry, which is actually a pretty cool way to do that, uh, Lisa wrote a poem. Uh, the, <laughs> the poets of Arkansas, or the great chicken poets. The of great Arkansas. chicken poets of Arkansas. Are you ready for the great chicken? I'm poets ready of for Arkansas? the great chicken poets of Arkansas. Um, let me backtrack in case anyone has joined us late. I, I am from San Francisco, and I drove um, across country and uh, came to Arkansas actually by accident. Uh, and when I arrived in, in Siloam Springs at the visitor center, I had this experience uh, recorded here in this here poem, which is a true story. It's called The Great Chicken Poets of Arkansas, or You Say Tomato and I Say Tomato. Clearly, she didn't want to be there fielding tourists at the visitor information center, Siloam Springs, Arkansas. Boredom dripped out in her sighs and Fingers grazing tired across a map. Here a river, there a lake, everywhere a good time. Nevertheless, she was helpful, if by rote. Miss Arkansas information at last became inexplicably animated as I neared the exit. Tourism is very important to Arkansas. It's the number two, uh, uh, industry? Yes, yes, right after poetry. I perked clean out of my interstate days. Nobody told me poetry was big business in Arkansas. <laughs> poetry, I repeated, incredulous. 
Oh, yes, she puffed. Chicken, turkey, all kinds of poetry. Well, I'd just come from a cowboy poetry festival in Oklahoma, so why not chicken poetry? My informant chirped merrily, why, there's Tyson and Cargill and no doubt famous Arkansas chicken poets, I deduced. Inspired by my interest, she crowed, yep, we've got more farms than anywhere else in America. Farms? Ah. Everything I really needed to know about the Arkansas accent, I learned in that exchange with the poultry pep gal at the visitor center, Siloam Springs, Arkansas. But you didn't turn around and go back. No, I didn't. It really had to sink in for a while. The enormity of, of what I had just experienced. <laughs> Obsession. Why are nine out of ten women dissatisfied with some aspect of their own bodies? The beauty industry is the beast. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you know, we had so much fun here today, and I wish you'd all put your hands together for Jan for putting this all on the song, people, and everyone. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. Um, the first song that we're going to do is um, one that I wrote this last, oh, a little over a year ago. I started going through my midlife crisis or growth or whatever, and and I was over Peggy's one day, and she kind of inspired me to write yeah, song. We were looking at, at a... There was a musical act coming to town, these two women that were going to be playing, and, and something inside me snapped. It was like the June Cleaver inside of me wanted to get a shag haircut and a pair of boots and become a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so the song is called Time for a Change. <laughs> Patricia Mickelson, I'm public access, and so are you. Parkinson's disease is a neurological movement disorder affecting an estimated one million Americans, including many under age 40. 
The American Parkinson Disease Association is the largest grassroots network in the United States, working to help ease the burden and find the cure for those coping with Parkinson's. Visit APDAoptimism.org today to find out how you can help millions live with dignity and optimism. Your action today will help APDA put an end to Parkinson's disease. As a VA doctor, I get more time to focus on my patients. And as you can imagine, the rewards are considerable. So are the benefits. Plus, I only need one active state license to practice in any VA facility. You know, it's bigger than giving back to my country. It's giving our veterans the care they deserve. Learn more about careers with today's VA at vacareers.va.gov. Politics in general and jobs that don't pay enough 40 hour work weeks. Books full of boring stuff, schools that should teach, but kids don't learn a thing. These are a few of my least favorite things. Healthcare that won't heal and how people treat the earth. Paying tolls and taxes, disbelief in self-worth, bitter cold winters that cut into spring. These are a few of my least favorite things. Religions that claim they're true don't get me started. Standards that double and people cold-hearted. Judgment and bias when freedom don't ring. These are a few of my least favorite things. All the lying, all the killing, when I'm depressed and sad. I add that to all of my least favorite things, and then I feel really bad. <laughs> Be like Julie Andrews or something.